Okay, so good morning. Welcome to the second lecture on my uh, little introduction to optomechanics. Yesterday I uh, mainly uh, talked about uh, optical resonators and mechanical resonances in solids as separated objects and uh, I introduced to you essentially the description of this open quantum dynamics where we include damping and we have this additional uh, forces, thermal forces acting on the mechanical oscillators at the typical frequencies in the megahertz or low gigahertz regime. And for the optical resonators, it's uh, the, uh, mainly uh, vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field at the high optical frequencies. If you are talking about uh, microwave, uh, uh, the microwave domain, uh, as in John uh, Tufel's uh, work, then we should also take into account um, maybe some thermal occupation uh, at the relevant uh, gigahertz frequencies of, of these circuits. Now today I'm finally uh, going to talk about uh, the coupling of these two systems and this will be part C, the optomechanical interaction. And thanks to my uh, to the other speakers, I can uh, be very uh, quick on, on, on that, I guess. So in principle, the, the main mechanism is a, that the cavity frequency depends on the position of the oscillator, as we heard in Yaroslav's uh, Yaroslav's talks um, already. And I will give two examples uh, how, how this is achieved, but let's start by just assuming this is the case. The Hamiltonian for the cavity would be then Still this, and this also has to be understood in some sort of Born-Oppenheimer uh, approximation. We assume that this uh, oscillation of the mechanical oscillator is slow on a relevant uh, time scale of the cavity. If you if you think of the Fabry-Barrot resonator, it would be the round trip time of the photon. So the motion of the mechanical oscillator should be adiabatic on the frequency um, of the of the cavity. And then we can simply assume that there is this parametric dependence of the cavity frequency uh, on the mechanical oscillator. And we can perform a Taylor expansion of that. So we assume that Xm has some equilibrium position and we expand about this. And then we have here a term which depends on the derivative with respect to this position, and we have a dagger a xm. So this is uh, yet the, the real position of the of the oscillator. That means I'm uh, talking here about the, what I introduced yesterday as the capital letter x. And we can remember now that we introduced the dimensionless coordinate, which is the real coordinate scaled to the zero point fluctuation, and then what we have here we can write as a dagger a times the uh, dimensionless coordinate xm and I introduced uh, the single photon coupling strength which is the derivative of the cavity frequency with respect to the amplitude of the oscillator times the zero point fluctuation. So that is a, a rate, G naught. We like to express things in rates in order to make them comparable. And this is, uh, has the dimension of a rate. No? We have a rate per length times length. And that characterizes the strength of our uh, optomechanical interaction. 
and actually it is uh, common well let's let's keep it in, uh, like that it is common to uh, uh, better to introduce this with a minus here so we absorb a minus uh, um, on this side so if we look at what uh, is achievable in uh, uh, experiments. I again take uh, this cataplot from the review of modern physics. Uh, I cited uh, yesterday, and here you have uh, a bunch of experiments of uh, in different regimes: microwave, photonic crystals, uh, levitated nano objects, micro resonators, mirrors, uh, up to down to cold atoms. Where uh, on the y-axis here we have the G naught. And uh, in this plot, this is compared to the cavity decay rate kappa, which you know, is typically, again, in the, rate, uh, in the range of hundreds of kilohertz uh, up to, to gigahertz. And the uh, uh, single photon strong, single photon coupling G0 is more in the range of uh, hertz up to uh, tens of, of kilohertz. So if you take the ratio, uh, of these two scales, then you see that uh, at least four years ago, uh, experiments were mainly in the regime below 10 to the minus 2. There were some exceptions here, uh, points 28 and uh, uh, 29, and these are all cold atoms. So for cold atoms, we can really have a ratio of G0 over kappa. That means that a displacement on the scale of a zero point fluctuation shifts the cavity frequency by a full line width. Yeah? This is what G0 tells us. How much does the cavity frequency shift if the oscillator is displaced by one zero point fluctuation? For atoms, this can be a huge effect on the scale of the line width of the cavity. For normal systems, four years ago, this was on the order of uh, 10 to the minus uh, uh, three or so. Uh, it improved uh, in recent years, but still, the strong coupling effect, like in cold atoms uh, um, uh, trapped in, inside cavities, as uh, uh, Oriol explained it in, in the previous lecture, uh, has not been achieved in these micromechanical systems. OK, so I want to talk briefly about two examples. Uh, what this G naught, how this G naught is uh, calculated, uh, sort of uh, uh, from a uh, for, for, from first principles. The most trivial or easy case is, of course, the one where we have the Trappi Perot resonator, and we already heard yesterday that the cavity frequency here is a multiple of the free spectral range. And the free spectral range scales like the inverse of the uh, length of this subrepero resonator. And now, if this is a movable mirror, then the length itself depends on the position. So we take a coordinate system where a positive displacement causes a longer cavity, and the longer cavity. Uh, will have a lower frequency, and then you can quickly calculate that omega c of xm will be omega c, and in first order Taylor expansion, it will be minus omega c, and then this uh, 1 over L times uh, xm. So the, the G0 in, in this simple case is just the optical frequency and then the ratio of the zero point fluctuation over the length. Here you could say, well, I'm happy because omega c is a really large frequency, but the zero point fluctuations on the order of uh, femtometer or so for typical uh, micromechanical uh, uh, experiments in the length uh, on the order of several uh, uh, wavelengths make this G0 still uh, comparatively a small scale uh, on the order of 100 hertz or maybe a kilohertz or so. In typical uh, micro mechanical experiments uh, with, with movable end mirrors. It can be larger and 
the experiments achieving largest uh, coupling in the case of optical fields, microwave uh, systems, electromechanical systems uh, are a different uh, games, so they are in a better shape uh, in terms of G0, but for optical uh, fields, the systems achieving highest couplings are optomechanical crystals. And these are structures like uh, these ones. Yaroslav uh, introduced these systems also in, in his talk uh, yesterday. So the idea, as he pointed out already, is to uh, uh, take a nano object and structure it in, uh, as a periodic array. Um, so you take a dielectric material and you cut holes in, in order to make some uh, periodic array. And in this way, uh, as you know, one can shape the bands for optical fields. So this is uh, uh, shown here. Uh, I don't know, I don't go into, into detail here, but it's a periodic array. You should expect bands. This is what you get. If you change the periodicity, you can even uh, achieve localized fields. So you can build cavities out of, of uh, um, uh, these structures. And because also phonons are pro propagating here, uh, the same periodicity will shape the phonons, the phonon bands of these structures. And by the same uh, 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 tuning of the periodicity, you can also localize phonon fields. So without going into details on how these phonon and photon modes uh, look like, which typically requires some finite element analysis, which uh, I don't want to do here, uh, we can derive a formula for how these uh, two degrees of freedom, phonons and photons, in such a dielectric structured uh, uh, system coupled to each other. And there is a formula which is used in this community and uh, that uh, has been uh, derived several years ago in, in, a, in a way I don't really understand. So uh, we sat down and, and re-derived it and I want to uh, show this little calculation to you. So what we assume is a dielectric material. This would be, for example, this, this bridge here. And we, I assume that this is lossless and non-dispersive as a start. And this material has a permittivity epsilon of R, which is distributed in space and takes on two values. So here uh, we would have vacuum in, in one part and the uh, permittivity of the material in the, in the other part. So when R is inside this material, it would be epsilon 1. When R is outside this material, say in vacuum, it would be epsilon 2. And I would like to write this uh, uh, piecewise constant uh, function here over uh, space in the following form. I write it as epsilon 2 plus epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1 times theta of r, where theta of r is a step function. It's 1 inside the medium, and it's zero outside this medium. OK, now when we are talking about uh, phonons, we uh, have to think about how the displacement of uh, this material, how the phonons uh, change essentially the permittivity of uh, the, the permittivity I'm writing here and how that in turn changes the energy of the electromagnetic field. So what we need is the energy of the electromagnetic field 
in its dependence on the permittivity, and then we think about how the permittivity depends on the phonons. So let's write down the Hamiltonian for an electromagnetic field inside a lossless, non-dispersive dielectric. So we have the integral over space, which is the, and the integral is over the energy density of the electromagnetic field. So there is one over the permittivity times the electric displacement field plus the contribution from the magnetic part, which does not depend on the, on the permittivity. And now the electric displacement field D is epsilon of R times E. How now does the displacement field, the mechanical displacement field of these structures affect the permittivity. And there are two mechanisms uh, how this is affected. So you remember the mechanical displacement field I introduced uh, yesterday that's essentially due to the uh, amplitudes of all normal modes of this structure. Maybe ultimately we will be interested in only one, then this displacement field uh, will be mainly, uh, maybe dominantly given by the amplitude and the mode function by this particular phonon mode we're interested in, but in, in principle there are many, many of them uh, involving all those, those bands available uh, in the material. So let's talk about the fundamental thing, the, the mechanical displacement field. And this affects the permittivity via two channels. The first one is called electrostriction. And that is the change of epsilon 1 with the displacement field. So you can imagine that uh, this mechanical displacement field will, uh, will, will induce uh, a variation of the density of this material. So it, the material due to the oscillations will get more dense in one place and maybe less dense in, in another place. And due to these density fluctuations, the index of refraction will change. And that will change epsilon 1. Okay, so this is electrostriction. It's a bulk effect. This is going on inside the medium. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about it. One can treat it in a very similar way as I will uh, do for the second process. And this second process is the radiation pressure. And this is a change of the surface with u of r. So we neglect maybe a change of the, the index of refraction of epsilon 1 inside the material, but we're interested in the change of the surface of this object. Okay, how does the oscillation displace the boundary between the volumina we're looking at here. This will be, well, I'm talking about a surface here, a surface effect. And then it's not surprising that for small systems, 
approaching the wavelength. This effect of radiation pressure is dominant. So let's treat this one. If you know how to treat this one, then you can figure out how to uh, treat the electrostriction. Um, also, uh, that's not very, very difficult. Yes? Pardon? A small system uh, approaching the, the, the wavelength, essentially, roughly. Okay. In principle, I mean, there is no sharp transition. Uh, one can calculate both effects, and as you reduce the dimension of these systems, uh, you will just see that there is at some point a crossover. And where this crossover exactly is really depends on the geometry and so on. I cannot make a, a general, give a general ruling. OK, so what we are. Uh, uh, trying to calculate now, now is the variation of the permittivity depending on the shift of the boundary in these uh, volumina, depending on the shift of, of this theta function. And when we know how the theta function changes with the uh, displacement field, we simply plug it in here and, and calculate this integral. Okay? So that, that could be our uh, first uh, uh, guess how to proceed. So let's calculate the first order correction. Of epsilon of R. With U of R. So we want to calculate the variation of epsilon, which I call here delta epsilon, uh, with this change of the, of the surface. So we essentially have to uh, look at the variation of this uh, theta here. And this would be the variation of epsilon 2. The constant disappears. So we have epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1. Yes? Uh, da, da, da. Of course, it's epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2. Thank you. Yes. So it's epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2. And then the variation of this step function here with the displacement would be the directional gradient of this step function with respect to the displacement. Okay, maybe I'm writing this down in better handwriting. So we take the directional derivative of the step function with respect to the uh, displacement field, the mechanical displacement field. Now, from the mathematical point of view, what I'm writing here is uh, a horrible uh, object. We have something like a 3D step function. And now we are taking the gradient of it in the direction of u of r. So this makes sense only uh, in, in, a, in, in a distribution, but we have to plug it in this integral so uh, we know how to deal with it. In 1D, you know that uh, the uh, step function, if you are on the real line only, uh, would be 0 and 1. Say if r is larger than 0 or uh, it is 1, if it's smaller than 0, uh, it's 0. And then the derivative of the step function would be a delta function. Yeah? Now, in 3D, we still have to expect that this is the, the case here. And I know I, I will show how, how to uh, evaluate this uh, volume integral here. Essentially, this uh, uh, gradient of theta will turn the volume integral in a surface integral. And uh, this dv, this volume element, will turn into the surface element pointing uh, in, in uh, the normal direction. And then we have to take the scalar product with this uh, displacement field here. So in principle, we just have to, to plug this in here. Now, of course, we have to be careful, because in principle, we have here 1 over the, the, uh, um, the permittivity. And what we calculated is the variation of the permittivity. Now, taking the, the inverse of that, 
we should look at this as a delta function. That's uh, not a good idea. So we should actually directly calculate the variation of one over the permittivity. And this can be done. So I'll keep the, the energy here. So 1 over the permittivity, you can express as 1 over epsilon 2 plus 1 over epsilon 1 minus 1 over epsilon 2 times our 3D step function. And then the variation of this would be 1 over epsilon 1, 1 over epsilon 2, and then the same thing, u of r gradient in the direction of theta in the direction u. So you understand why we have to do that. I mean, this is a step function. When we want to take the derivative, we, have, we, we get this delta function. This is a, a, a sound way of writing this down. Taking the inverse directly of this is not a sound way. Now, we could plug this in the expression for our field, Hamilton, for, for our uh, energy of the, of the uh, electromagnetic field, and expect that now we get the variation of H from calculating this integral. So we, I simply plug in the variation here. So that would be 1 over epsilon 1, 1 over epsilon 2 u r directional derivative of theta. And then there is the displacement field squared. And now the volume. Integral would be evaluated, as I announced previously, into a surface integral, which I write here is uh, dv times u of r. So that is the projection of the displacement on the surface into the direction of the surface element, times 1 over epsilon 1 minus 1 over epsilon 2 d r squared. So this is what we would get, but actually it's wrong. Because uh, what the problem here is that the electric displacement field uh, has a step. It's a discontinuous field on the surface, at least some uh, uh, components of the dielectric field. So when evaluating this here, we are evaluating a, de a delta function and uh, the integrand here is not continuous at the surface. So this is uh, actually not the, the, the correct answer. We have to be a little bit more careful. So problem. D D parallel is discontinuous on surface. So you know that, that fields, uh, field amplitudes can uh, uh, have uh, discontinuities if, you, if we have steps in the index of refraction. And for t parallel, this happens uh, uh, to be the case. Now, uh, what we have to do to resolve this problem is we can rewrite our Hamiltonian at least close to the surface, so maybe this integral we can restrict already uh, to a, uh, a small shell around the surface. And in this small shell, we decompose the 
the energy density in terms of continuous quantities and this is the parallel component of E and the normal component of D. And now the variation would be just the variation of these permittivities and that finally leads to the correct answer. So we get again this contribution here. The displacement field projected into the normal of the surface element and then the variation of the permittivity we already calculated. That's epsilon one minus epsilon two, E normal, a parallel. And then there is a minus one over epsilon one over epsilon two, D normal. Okay. And this is the final formula. You wouldn't guess it, no? But it is used by Oscar Painter and uh, um, essentially everyone, everybody producing these optomechanical crystals to evaluate the G knots. Now imagine that this U involves only one particular relevant mode, then this will be essentially some mode function Um of R times the displacement, the amplitude, and this field amplitude squared here in normal order, order if there is only one relevant uh, mode here, then this will be A dagger A, maybe times some field mode parallel squared and the same for D. So you see that structurally what we get out of this formula is again something like G naught XM A dagger A. So what is done is you perform finite element analysis for these structures, identify the relevant uh, modes, and then you plug the mode functions uh, in here, evaluate these integrals, and identify your G naught. Apart from the coupling of this particular uh, single mode uh, of the, of the uh, uh, cavity to the single relevant mode of the mechanical oscillator, you can also evaluate this for a multimode system and then you get all kinds of cross coupling between photon modes and maybe different mechanical modes and so on and so forth. This is all covered by this formula. You can apply it also to extended systems and, and get Briolin or optomechanics out of that, but we continue uh, with single uh, mode or two mode optomechanics having one mechanical mode and one, one optical mode. But this is, should just give you an impression of how G knots are calculated in these systems uh, from, a, uh, from scratch. Any question? Good. Then we proceed and believe that our fundamental interaction is of this form G naught XM A dagger A. And look at equations of motion. So now I take what I derived yesterday I have my cavity mode of frequency omega c, power decay rate kappa, so the amplitude decays at minus kappa half. Then on top of that, there will be these vacuum fluctuations driving the cavity. I'm just writing down what I derived yesterday. And here we have I omega m plus gamma m half frequency of the oscillator 
damping of the oscillator plus its driving field. And now we add the optomechanical interaction. So I set h bar to zero here. So we, what we evaluate is g naught a dagger a um, b plus b dagger a plus i g naught a dagger a b plus b dagger b. Evaluate the commutator. We get g naught b plus b dagger a. And here we get g naught a dagger a. These are equations Jaroslav was uh, writing down also uh, the other day. How is this uh, optomechanical interaction interpreted in, in that language? You can take this term here and actually absorb it here. We pull out the A, and then we see that due to this I, G naught, the whole thing looks at the correction to the frequency. Well, this is the way we derived it. On the side of the mechanical oscillator, we see that the mechanical oscillator is subject to a force which is proportional to the to the photon number a dagger a. Yeah? So the uh, photons being reflected of this mirror exert a, a push, give momentum transfer, and also in these much more complicated uh, optomechanical crystals, uh, the photons will displace the uh, mechanical oscillator, will give uh, a certain uh, amplitude to, to its motion. Now, we could go on and analyze uh, this system and see what happens. Let me remind you at this stage that of the properties of these driving forces. So we assume that this is vacuum fluctuations. So A in, A in dagger have a two-time correlation proportional to the Dirac delta. And B in of T, B in of T prime dagger would be n bar plus 1 delta T minus T prime. So this is a thermal field. This is a vacuum field, which is the relevant uh, physics for uh, optomechanics in the, in the optical domain, in the, in the microwave domain. Again, uh, we could also include a thermal occupation here for, for the uh, light field. Both fields are otherwise free bosonic fields. So they have this commutator. So I'm writing this down just for completeness. We have seen this already uh, yesterday. All others, other uh, uh, correlators like a squared or b squared or so are zero. Um, b dagger. B is proportional to n bar times the delta correlation, uh, delta function, uh, which is implied by, by this commutator. So what happens uh, now in this system due to the optomechanical coupling? The answer is nothing, because the cavity is empty. We wouldn't see anything, uh, because we don't get photons out of this cavity. What we have to do to uh, see some physics at all is we have to drive the system. And this still has to be uh, put into the equations. No? So now we want to look at the optomechanical system. So far, we assumed vacuum fluctuations driving this optomechanical system. And now we will put a C number component uh, to this driving field, which is our laser. And this laser has a particular frequency. So the C number component is oscillating at the laser frequency. So this is essentially 
giving an average value to this uh, driving field A in, and the average value I pull out and treat it separately, separable, separately such that this A in stays uh, a vacuum uh, field. So what we do is we replace A in by A in plus alpha in e to the minus i omega lt, and alpha in is just a real number. It's not an operator anymore, and it is connected to the drive field amplitude. It is given by the square root of the power over h bar omega l. So it's essentially the square root of the number of photons impinging on this cavity per second. It's proportional to the square root of the photon flux. The more power we inject, the larger will be this, this alpha. Now this alpha has a frequency, omega l, the laser frequency, and it will be convenient to uh, take out this fast uh, frequency by moving to a rotating frame at laser frequency omega l. That means we define a tilde operators uh, for, the, for the cavity where we take out this large frequency omega l and when we look at the time derivative we would have i omega l a tilde plus e to the i omega l t a dot, and the A dot we have here, we plug it in there, and what we find is that A tilde dot is I delta naught minus kappa half A tilde plus square root of kappa a in plus i g naught b plus b dagger a tilde. What happened is that the frequency of the optical cavity essentially shifted to the difference between the drive frequency omega l and uh, omega c. So it's uh, common to define the detuning as the difference of omega l minus omega c, the laser frequency minus the, the cavity frequency. So we have the cavity resonance here. And now we can choose the laser drive and the detuning here is the difference between those two, with the convention that below resonance, the detuning is smaller than zero, and above resonance, the detuning is larger than zero. A remark here, the definition of the detuning is different in different communities. In atomic physics, in quantum optics, the logic is my cavity has a particular fixed frequency, and then, as an experimenter, I can choose my laser and tune it with respect to the cavity. So it makes sense to define the detuning in this way, uh, such that detuning is negative when I, I'm below the reference, which is the cavity frequency, and it is positive when I'm above. There are communities where this is used differently, and where the laser is the reference, and maybe a cavity is uh, tuned with respect to the laser. For example, in gravitational wave detectors community, uh, the, the detuning would be defined exactly the opposite way. And the reason is that they used like megawatts lasers, which whose uh, frequency is written in stone. I mean, they will not, they will not tune their megawatt lasers. Uh, 
this is uh, given by the laser system, and then the cavities which are involved in a gravitational wave detector are tuned with respect to the laser frequency. Yeah, so the convention is uh, uh, exactly uh, in this opposite way. But we, in uh, quantum optics, uh, like to do it uh, this way. So I immediately will drop the tilde. Yeah, and remember that the A's I'm writing are now defined with respect uh, to the, uh, are in the rotating frame of the laser field. So the equations of motion, uh, which I wrote here, and of course there will be now this a uh, very important term I missed to write down, square root of kappa alpha in, which is the laser drive. Now, this is a C number, or a real number in our convention, and we uh, expect, of course, that this inhomogeneous term here in this differential equation will cause a certain uh, a C number component also for A, or physically we expect that some uh, field will build up inside uh, the cavity. And now we want to treat this mean field of the cavity, and because the cavity exerts a push on the mechanical oscillator, there will be also a mean displacement of the mechanical oscillator. So we want to treat the C number components, the mean fields of the cavity and the oscillator, which are now induced by the laser drive. So we expect mean components of A and B. So we define, and this is something also Yaroslav uh, uh, started uh, to do yesterday, wrote down yesterday, we define fluctuations around this mean field, and the mean field I call alpha. And I define a fluctuation for B, and this mean field for B I call beta. Or in other words, I replace A by alpha plus a fluctuation, and I replace B by beta plus a fluctuation. I write here once ahead to make it clear that only the fluctuations are now quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. And with this ansatz, which I can always do, I mean, there is no approximation whatsoever made at this point, I uh, go into my equations of motion and rewrite those. Now there will be a bunch of terms. I look at the fluctuations variation in time of the fluctuation, I assume I manage to find time-independent uh, means, so time-independent alpha. So the only time independence here is in the fluctuations. This is, of course, an assumption which I will have to justify later on. So when we insert uh, the A dot from this side and replace everywhere A by alpha plus uh, delta A, then we will get uh, three sorts of terms. We will get uh, terms which are only uh, real numbers or C number components. We will get terms which are linear in fluctuations, and we will get terms which are quadratic in fluctuations. And I'm already sorting uh, all these contributions for you. So this is the C number contribution. Then there will be a linear contribution. And there will be the 
quadratic contribution. So zeroth, or, zeroth order in fluctuations, first order in fluctuations, second order in fluctuations. This is for the cavity. We can do the same thing for the mechanical oscillator, where we have the time, the change of the, the fluctuation, V dot. Just plug this in the equations of motion I was writing down, beta plus I G naught alpha squared minus I omega uh, plus Gm half delta beta plus I G naught alpha delta A daga plus alpha star delta A plus square root of gamma V in plus I G naught delta A daga delta A. Again, Serious order in fluctuation, linear in fluctuations, second order in fluctuations. Now our main idea of introducing these uh, means here, taking out the mean fields, is to deal with the, the driving uh, field we have here due to our laser. And by a proper choice of alpha and beta, we could try to cancel the whole C number component which we have here, and that would remove the driving field uh, from the game. So let's try to solve these equations by setting the first line here to zero. So we, what we do is we set the C number components to zero, and we get the equation I delta kappa half alpha plus I G naught beta plus beta star alpha plus square root of kappa alpha in is zero, and I omega m plus gamma m half beta plus I G naught alpha squared is also zero. Two nonlinear equations for alpha and beta. We can, for example, easily uh, eliminate beta from uh, the first equation by just uh, solving here for beta in terms of alpha. You see that beta would be proportional to alpha squared. If we set it in here, we get a cubic term in alpha. So the whole thing is equivalent to a cubic equation in alpha, or equivalently, we can also eliminate alpha and uh, plug in here and get a cubic equation for beta. Now, a cubic equation, in principle, has uh, three solutions. What does that mean? This means that this system might exhibit bistability. So there will be more than one state, stable or unstable, for this means. Yeah, so cubic equation can have three solutions. And I will not go into uh, detail. You can analyze this further. Uh, it's not, not hard. I mean, uh, check the conditions when a cubic equation has uh, three solutions. Uh, this occurs 
4 delta smaller than square root of 3 over 4 kappa minus square root of 3 over 4 kappa on the on the red side there can be a regime where for certain drive strengths uh, the optomechanical system becomes bistable unique solution exists for delta larger than minus 3 over 4 kappa. OK, so now we can uh, look, for example, at the solutions of uh, the cubic equation for beta versus the drive strength, and then for uh, uh, deltas, which are, uh, now I, I think I exactly got it uh, wrong here, so this should be flipped. Uh, for deltas, which are sufficiently uh, red tuned, uh, there could be uh, several solutions for a given drive field uh, for three possible uh, mechanical displacements, and the further analysis uh, shows that this will be an unstable point and this will be a stable point. So these are uh, things you know from, from uh, stability or bistability analysis in, in nonlinear uh, systems, I suppose. For uh, deltas which are sufficiently uh, uh, blue, larger than minus uh, uh, square root of 3 over 4 kappa, we always have a unique uh, solution. And this is uh, what we are going to uh, assume in the following. So we assume now we are in a stable, at a stable point here. Assume we have a unique solution. Yes. Because my, my goal is to derive uh, an equation for the fluctuations of this system, which I erased already. Well, it's still here for the mechanical oscillator. I want to know how the fluctuations evolve around the mean fields. So when I start to drive the system, I inject the laser, laser field, there will be an, uh, an effect on the mean, or the average dynamic of the system. And this average dynamic is described by, by these nonlinear equations. These equations are interesting enough. So there is a lot of interesting classical nonlinear physics uh, in there. But uh, let's assume we, we find a uh, um, uh, mean field uh, for the cavity and the mean displacement uh, for the mechanical oscillator. And then we are interested at the, uh, on the about the, the, the quantum fluctuations um, about this uh, mean field. So, firstly, we uh, assume a unique solution and we neglect the quadratic contribution. in equations of motion. So let's write these, uh, the resulting equations of motion down once more in order to uh, And now I drop the delta. So I replace uh, the fluctuations again by the A's in order to save some symbols. And we simply keep in mind that we are talking about fluctuations about the mean field. Plus square root of kappa A in. A in. And B dot would be I omega M minus gamma 
minus i omega m plus gamma half b plus i g a plus a dagger plus square root of gamma m b in. And the g I'm defining here is g naught times alpha. So look at here. We have alpha and alpha star, and let's assume that alpha is real, a phase we can uh, absorb uh, in a suitable way. So what we see is that G0 is multiplied by this mean field. Yaroslav was pointing this out uh, the other day already. And the same thing happens in the equation of motion for A, as you can check. So the interaction is now uh, uh, given by a G, which is multiplied by alpha. And uh, note that alpha squared is proportional to the number of photons in the cavity. So this is uh, typically a huge number and makes this part in the interaction, which we have here, much, much larger than this part, which scales like G0. So for alpha squared much larger than 1, and values here are typically on the order of, of 10 to the 6 or so, depending on your drive, the g will be much larger than g naught, which is the justification for uh, uh, dropping the quadratic contributions in the equations of motion. So these terms are there, but they're comparatively small, and we will not be able to see them. If we could see them, that would be a big thing. Okay, so that is still something we are looking for in optomechanics. I saw a poster yesterday where uh, this uh, contribution of the nonlinear terms and you know, the widening of the uh, optical cavity uh, uh, was uh, treated and observed, which is uh, uh, ultimately due to the G0 contribution here. So seeing a unique uh, uh, sign of, of this G0 dynamics would be very interesting. But even this dynamics uh, described by G uh, is very uh, uh, useful and interesting, as I will show uh, in the following. So this equations of motion result from an effective Hamiltonian which is composed of the energies of the two systems now with the effective energy of the of the uh, cavity in the frame rotating at the laser given by uh, minus delta A dagger A plus G A dagger A plus A dagger B plus B dagger. So when you read papers in optomechanics and uh, you see in equation one, this is the Hamiltonian for optomechanics, then the whole story of what I told you before is behind it. Okay? And then what you see in equation two after this Hamiltonian are these equations of motion where this part and this part, this part and this part follow from the Hamiltonian, but the damping and the noise, of course, doesn't. In order to see this, one has to treat a larger system and reduce it, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so you should, now you, I think you are able to you know, understand equation one and equation two, and you know what is behind. You don't need to do all this, you know, go this long path every time. Uh, but now it is important to go uh, this path once, at least. It is also important to remember that these A's and B's describe a fluctuation around uh, a mean field. Another important uh, uh, thing to note uh, with this Hamiltonian and these equations of motion is that now the Hamiltonian is quadratic in creation and annihilation operators, where it used to be cubic initially. What we did is we linearized the model 
going to a quadratic Hamiltonian and to linear equations of motion. Yeah? Now, uh, you immediately can say, well, linear dynamics, okay, this is classical. Yeah? And you're right. By Ehrenfest's theorem, we know that averages uh, um, of, of these quantum equations of motion behave in the same way as a classical system. And a classical physicist, whatever comes out of these equations, uh, would not be surprised to see because, you know, this looks very much classical, but because we believe in quantum mechanics, we know that these are vacuum fluctuations here. Yeah? And now we can track uh, what happens in these dynamics uh, with a macroscopic system, which we have here, driven in some way by vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. And this is the fun about optomechanics. Yeah? So we, can, we have this handle, we can switch on this interaction, it's linear, okay, but we have this very clean uh, vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field, zero temperature essentially, driving the mechanical system, macroscopic system. Okay? What comes out of, of, of this? Before we, we look into the dynamics of, of uh, these equations of motion, we should, however, check whether the model makes sense at all. Because the fluctuations we are treating here might actually be unstable. It might be that uh, a small initial fluctuation, maybe due to vacuum fluctuations or to some thermal fluctuations, will get amplified and explode. And we will not be able to describe a stable linear dynamics with this model. So we should think about the stability of our dynamics. And I will not go in much detail here. You can work this out easily on your own. Let's uh, define a vector A, a vector of operators, which is composed of A, A dagger, B, and B dagger and rewrite our equations of motion as a dot is m times a. It's a linear system, so we can write it in this uh, form and read off from these uh, equations of motion here a matrix m, plus there will be some forces a in, so this will be a vector of a ins and b ins and so on, and a condition for stability so this thing is stable if, and you understand this intuitively, the real part of the eigenvalues of m are smaller than zero. If the real part of the eigenvalues of m are smaller than zero, then these dynamics will be some sort of damping dynamics. If there will be at least one eigenvalue with, which has a, a positive real part, this will just blow up. Okay? This will amplify the initial, the, some, the external fluctuations, and the dynamics will, go, will, will not be well defined for uh, T getting large. And we should assume that if the amplitudes get larger and larger, our linear description will break down at some point, and we should go back to the nonlinear dynamics of the system and maybe include uh, things which are not at all in our model, like mechanical properties of, of the uh, structure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, for optomechanics, you can just read off this uh, matrix M from the linear equations of motion, calculate eigenvalues, take the real part, and plot it uh, in uh, uh, now here a plane where I plot the detuning on one axis and the coupling strength, which note is proportional to the amplitude alpha. So let's write this down once more. G is G naught times alpha, and alpha was the square root of the photon flux. So when I plot something with respect to G, that means plotting against power. There is a, a bistable corner. Oh, aha. Uh -huh. And you don't see the colors. Funny. So this uh, plot in reality looks like, uh, like this. So here is delta, here is chi. There is a bistable lobe for small enough delta. 
and then there is a unstable lobe for large G and a big unstable area for blue detuning. So this is delta larger than zero, and this is delta smaller than zero, and this is a bistable region. So we are unstable almost everywhere on the blue side. We get unstable for large uh, driving fields, uh, large couplings here, and I plot this here uh, in omega m in terms of uh, the mechanical uh, resonance frequency, and this is roughly about uh, 1 or 1.1 or so. So when the, the coupling gets larger than the mechanical frequency, we are in trouble also on the, on the red side. Let's, that still leaves room for uh, physics. Uh, let's start first on the red side and uh, uh, for sufficiently small Gs. And this is what I'm going to treat now. I'm going to treat first the regime of weak coupling. So that would be this area here. Weak coupling is, I assume, that G is smaller than kappa. Maybe much smaller, but uh, decently smaller is, is uh, uh, typically fine. So a factor of three uh, uh, is typically sufficient uh, to make the formulas which I'm going to derive now um, apply, applicable. So our interest, uh, our aim now is to uh, derive an effective equation of motion for the mechanical oscillator. In this uh, regime of uh, G much smaller than kappa, without making an assumption on how omega m over delta compared to kappa with respect to kappa. So we want to treat the regime where kappa is maybe larger than omega m or delta or smaller. We just want to use this as a small parameter and get an effective equation of motion to first order in G over kappa in this regime. So what we uh, do now is we move to a rotating frame. With respect to the mechanical frequency and the detuning. So for example, for the cavity, we introduce again tilde operators, now oscillating at the detuning. And for the B, we introduce tilde operators oscillating at the mechanical frequency. And for these tilde operators, the equation of motion for the one for the cavity, for example, looks like this. So this is still 
uh, exact. And now we integrate and we get a formal solution, which is e to the minus kappa half tau e to the i delta plus omega m t minus tau b t minus tau plus e to the minus i delta plus omega m t minus tau b dagger t minus tau plus square root of kappa plus the vacuum fluctuations from outside. So there will be also uh, terms which depend on A naught, but they will damp out this kappa. And we're interested in times which are larger uh, than kappa. And now you see that the field of the cavity will get some you know, contribution from the mechanical oscillator proportional to G. Then there will be some response function time integral, and we uh, have this convolution here with uh, the, the uh, operators from the mechanical system. But now these B tildes, they evolve, because we are working in the rotating frame, they evolve at a slow rate. So this is essentially B tilde of T plus something on the order itself scaling like G. And in order to get an uh, equation for A tilde at t, which is correct in first order of g, we can neglect this thing and replace B tilde of t minus tau by B tilde. And the same we can do here. So this is assuming that the cavity decays fast on the scale of kappa, and B tilde is slowly evolving slowly on the same scale, evolving at the uh, order at the scale of g. So g over kappa is our small parameter here. This will become more evident once we take the integrals. So a tilde of t will be i g, and now I define a symbol eta plus b tilde e to the minus i delta plus omega m t plus eta minus b tilde dagger e to the minus i delta minus omega m t plus 2 over square root of kappa a in, and I call this a in tilde. I'll explain it in a second. And these coefficients eta plus minus are 1 over kappa half minus delta minus i delta plus minus omega m. Sorry, it's defined the other way around, minus plus. So it's uh, exactly the, the flip sign here. So these uh, coefficients eta here, they come from taking this, this integral uh, with respect to tau. And the integrand here is e to the minus kappa half. And then on this side, minus i delta plus omega m. When we integrate with respect to tau, we get this uh, complex uh, number in the denominator. Yeah? And we get once kappa half minus i delta plus omega from here. 
And then this is, of course, delta minus omega. Sorry for this confusion here. So this is important. This is very important. This thing here, I'm a bit sloppy uh, due to uh, time running out. This is a filtered noise process. So whatever happens from here to here is hidden in the tilde. Okay. But it's still uh, essentially uh, white noise. And this solution, which is called the adiabatic solution for the Kevigny field, This solution, we can plug in the equations of motion for the mechanical oscillator. The procedure we're applying here is adiabatic uh, elimination of a fast variable. In this case, the fast variable is the cavity. It's fast because it's decaying as kappa, which we assume is the largest uh, 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 rate in the, in the problem if we are working in the rotating frame here. So we didn't assume anything about the size of delta and omega m. Adiabatic uh, elimination, we will have maybe seen in the literature, and typically it's also something which is confusing for beginning students. It should uh, serve here as a hint of how to deal with it. So this solution we can plug into the equation of motion for, sorry, B tilde, and I have to stop at 12.30, no? Do I? Yes. Yeah? Um, so I will now jump over a few lines and give you the result of this plugging in of our adiabatic solution. You can che check that finally you arrive at an equation of motion which you can rearrange in the following way. Where delta omega m is a shift of the mechanical frequency, which is g squared, and then the imaginary part of eta minus minus eta plus star. Eta are the coefficients I uh, introduced before. Gamma opt is an optically induced shift of the mechanical damping. is defined as 2g squared and the real part of the same quantity. And this we can write as the difference of two rates, gamma minus and gamma plus, with obvious definitions. And these uh, gamma minus and gamma plus rates show up here in the noise, which is radiation pressure noise on the mechanical oscillator. And these two noise processes here refer to vacuum fluctuations at sidebands. So A in plus minus of T, A in plus minus of T prime are white noise processes. And they still correspond to vacuum noise. So this is the, the final result of 
uh, the final equation for weak coupling optomechanics. That's the equation of motion of the mechanical oscillator dressed by the cavity field. For arbitrary detunings, arbitrary uh, mechanical frequencies uh, in the uh, regime where kappa is larger than g. And it still contains a lot of interesting physics, which I'm afraid I have to uh, uh, teach you tomorrow. Uh, it contains, in particular, sideband cooling effects. It contains state, coherent state swaps. It contains coherent entanglement. It contains the standard quantum limit. So there is a lot of physics uh, inside, and this is finally the subject of tomorrow's lecture. Thank you very much. Questions?